Great. Um, I'm going to kind of start with just a little background. When I was at Lincoln Center a number of years ago, um, I uh, was had the honor, the pleasure of working in an environment where we talked about aesthetic literacy. And aesthetic literacy um, was really how we help people perceive, understand, deepen their knowledge. Um, we did it or focused on the arts or a work of art as an object of study. Um, but I always felt you could take that same kind of aesthetic literacy um, concept and focus it toward any subject, any topic. Um, and in fact, um, as long as it's a, an object that can be studied and objects that can be studied, at least in our viewpoint, were objects that um, uh, the study repaid itself that it, was, it had enough layers of complexity to it that the study not only repaid itself in terms of potential action, but the knowledge that underlies or, or fosters that action. Um, I got interested as we were doing it as imagination, um, as an offshoot of it, because uh, Dewey, John Dewey, the American educational philosopher talked about it. Um, but I was really taken by the concept of what is, an, what is aesthetic literacy. And aesthetic literacy, according to Dewey, was uh, the difference between an aesthetic and an anesthetic experience. An experience that um, dump, num, you know, numbs you or dulls your senses or takes away your capacity to ask questions and, and the like. Whereas an aesthetic experience awakens you, it makes you curious it, and it gives you the energy and the curiosity. In education, it's more of a constructivist, constructivist view of learning, um, which is how we make meaning and how we learn through meaning making. So I got interested in it and I looked at my Rolodex, quite literally my Rolodex at that point, um, and said, who influences me? Who do I know? And I realized when I looked at my Rolodex, because I was at this really great organization with international reach, that I was, um, I had a connection to people um, around the globe, but was it the right grouping or was it a sufficient grouping or a relevant grouping? Um, so I decided I was keynoting a talk for the National Endowment for the Arts, and I'm sure you've had that experience where you have a thought in the back of your brain, and somehow unbeknownst to you know, your conscious mind, that thought just kind of inches forward, inches forward. And I heard myself say without any real sense of what I was meant by it, um, we're going to do 50 imagination conversations around the United States over the next two years. Um, we're going to do them in every state. Um, obviously, I had to kick off a process to make that happen, uh, and we did. We ended up doing 60 of them around the U.S., reached well over 8 million people um, through social media, through live stream, through online work. They ended up being sponsored by governors, business leaders, um, and lots of different organizations. Um, and that kind of became the fodder or the, the fuel for this type of, of thinking is, how do we get people in a cross-sectoral, non-vertical, more horizontal approach to problem solving, address works of art? In this case, the topic would be climate change. Um, when I left Lincoln Center, I decided to shelve them for a while. I created a number of schools, the co-created a number of schools to try to um, get that understanding uh, looking at it from a pedagogical perspective and see how you can actually create um, schools for kids that can learn through this kind of methodology, this kind of pedagogy. Um, I kind of then shelved the whole thing. And when COVID hit, I asked myself the same question, who influences me? And I looked at LinkedIn as my Rolodex. Um, I then started to use six degrees of separation as kind of an organizing tool went from about 2,500 people on LinkedIn to now about 17,000. The number is not important, it's the range and diversity of people that's important. And I've consciously been curating a list of people 
that allows for this kind of cross-sectoral, cross-cultural, cross-boundaries cross, um, uh, exchange. And uh, the goal remains to um, talk about imagination as it relates to human development, as it relates to topical issues or existential issues like climate change. Um, uh, I have an organization called Litroff Consulting, where this is what we do um, for organizations. We're developing learning management systems to figure out ways to bake imagination into the ecosystem, the ecoculture of organizations. Um, we're also working with how do you codify the imagination conversations themselves so they're truly outcome-based. And then how do you, um, once again, bring that not only in ed education, but in commerce and culture. I was fortunate enough to meet two incredibly dynamic people who have both become friends and now three have become friends. Um, Keshev Naha and Demiana, um, who represent different organizations. And with their permission, I'd love for them to say a few words about themselves and their organization. Thank you so much, Scott, for this wonderful introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm Keshav. Uh, I'm the founder of the DAIS, one of the organizing partners for the event, along with uh, my dear colleague, Scott Noha from People of Impact and Litroff Consulting. Uh, just a bit about us, uh, we are an organization which is dedicated to the achievement of sustainable development goals. Uh, we're based out of India and we work uh, with primary focus on goal 13, climate action, uh, gender equality, goal 5 and quality education, along with peace and justice. Uh, and as we understand that all these goals, sustainable development goals are interrelated, they can't be achieved without each other. So. That uh, leads us to different stakeholders and uh, and I think people of impact again and Litroff have, have been uh, really close partners in the journey, along with the, our partners who have also joined in for today's conversation. So a warm welcome to all. Uh, this is also uh, Global Goals Week, so, uh, so I think it's a special occasion where we are all joining. Critical juncture. Uh, a bit about imagination. Uh, I think when COVID-19 happened and so many other geopolitical events have happened we often say that we never imagined the world that uh, that is today and and i think if problems are going beyond imagination solutions also need to come uh, from beyond, beyond our our current systems our status quo uh, and and i think imagination plays a, a very big role in that process so thank you to scott for for bringing that forward um, Without taking too much time, I think I uh, before uh, I hand over to Noha, um, my my only message to everyone is coming from one of my favorite books, which is uh, The Little Prince, and you know it says that it is only with a heart that one can see rightly, and what is essential uh, is invisible to the eye. So so let us uh, let us think from our hearts, let us imagine, and let's have a, fan, a fascinating conversation and use this to create an action. That is much needed on, on climate. So thank you so much uh, once again for all of you to, to have joined us. And I'd love to now invite Noha Hefni, the founder of uh, People of Impact, to take the floor, please. So thank you so much, uh, Keshav and Scott and Demiana, my dear partner in People of Impact, for really putting your heart and passion into this event. It's a pleasure to be here. I am the founder of People of Impact. Um, it is a digital ecosystem to accelerate action on the SDGs. But in doing so, we're always looking for ways to find non-traditional and disruptive solutions to the SDGs. Because as you all know too well, and especially after COVID-19, progress you know, on most of the SDGs have stagnated. In, addi in addition to that, the most impacted globally are women and girls and youth. And when it comes to uh, climate change as well, we look at that issue and you know there is a great need for awareness, sensitization of different audiences, engaging youth in that uh, dialogue and bringing in non-traditional actors beyond the UN, beyond the NGOs that can truly tell us how to move forward in new and non-traditional disruptive ways to address a very systemic issue such as this one. So our digital ecosystem is built on that foundation of advancing 
uh, multi-stakeholder collaborations to accelerate action on the SDGs and to find systemic solutions for systemic issues. So on this note, I really call on all of us here today. This is an imagination conversation. And therefore, I urge everyone to leave our differences behind, our nationalities, our religions, our ethnicities, and to bring our creativity and innovation and innovative thinking to the table in order to bring about those non-traditional solutions. On the sidelines of the UNGA, as Keisha mentioned, uh, it is Global Goals Week. Today is its first uh, day. And at the same time, world leaders will be coming together to really you know, continue to debate and find solutions for these uh, crucial SDG uh, challenges. However, what we need is to really go beyond uh, that box of policy and think of those solutions that haven't been heard. Think of bringing our knowledge and expertise and tapping into the collective uh, strength and ideas of all gathered here with this amazing and exceptional expertise that, that Scott and, and others have managed to gather today, you know, to really offer new insights, new approaches that are stemming out of people. And again, as the representative of People of Impact and on behalf of the MIANA, we are all about, you know, bridging the gap between people and organizations, whether public and private, and bringing that perspective and those ideas to the forefront. So as a partner of Global Goals Week, we'll be very happy to take forward any outcomes from this conversation. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Scott to uh, take us right into this, uh, this very exciting imagination conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the structure of today is we're going to have this type of discussion um, kind of back and forth. Um, then we're going to go into breakout rooms, talk about some questions um, that have more to do with imagination, imaginative thinking, um, then come back into a group context. Um, I'm sure each of you, you know, since this is an amazing group of people. I'm sure each of you have had this experience. And the experience I'm talking about is what I call the Friday afternoon, Monday morning problem. So we get together Friday morning, we have these great conversations, great meetings, great events, um, and we're jazzed. We're excited about the outcomes or the knowledge that came out of it. The problem has always been, at least in my experience, um, by Monday morning, we we're either too damn busy to um, do much with what we talked about on Friday, or we forget a lot of what was discussed. Um, but in the absence of that, we end up having great talks, but not followed by a lot of action or a lot of concrete action, specific action. So these are designed, and I, and I say this with all the respect due to TED Talks and Chris Anderson, and Chris was um, you know, good enough early on to advise us, you know, on some of this. Um, but uh, this has to be outcome oriented. It can't just be um, how we have good chats on Friday afternoon or Friday morning. It's got to be what happens Monday morning. So in an ideal setting, we actually would then be taking this group. And since all change, I do believe, still is local or, or oriented locally, um, we would have people who are picking it up quite literally Monday morning and talking um, about it and trying to create concepts, ideas, directions, and the like that come out of the Friday afternoon um, discussion. So if you think of that as kind of a, almost a visual uh, you know, template for uh, how we approach our work, how we approach our conversation, we're not just trying to engage in an interesting conversation. We're also trying to say, what are we doing with it? Where is it leading? Um, and how is it going to impact people? Um, the second part of that is um, in imagination first. Um, one of the people we interviewed was a child psychologist, Alison Gobnik. And uh, uh, she used an image uh, that she said is true of, of um, the way children perceive and the way adults perceive. And the image was um, children tend to see the world more as a lantern, take in the world more as a lantern. Um, adults tend to take it in more as a spotlight. Um, we tend to focus on what it is that we're trying to solve or think about 
rather than allowing us to be infused with understandings and other influences and the imagination of others, the capacities of others. So to the degree possible, turn your spotlight off and turn your lantern on. Um, so we're not trying to solve climate change. This is not the right group to do that. Um, by design. We're not trying to talk about the economics of it per se, though all of that can come into it. Um, we're not trying to even talk about um, what's going to happen if we don't do it, but I do believe we all have a certain dread of that existential concern that if we do nothing or don't do enough, what will happen? Um, but I think it's important that we um, allow ourselves to be imaginative, to think about it in different ways. And some of that will come out today, some of it will come out after it, and some of it will come out um, from events that happen as a result. And just one concrete example, um, as I mentioned, uh, we were just doing a series of conversations in Madeira, uh, Portugal, a number of months ago, and Justin was, was there participating. Um, one of the unanticipated but incredibly delightful outcomes of that was I met um, through that conversation an economist um, from major uh, European university. And we're now looking at, um, we've exchanged position papers, we're now looking at how to talk about imagination from an economic perspective, the economic change perspective. How do you monetize it? How do you talk about it in economic terms, not just socio-intellectual uh, terms or educational terms, but why and how can we talk about it? Um, you know, from Adam Smith to Aristotle, kind of approach to you know thinking about it and and beyond that. The other kind of organizing template I'd like to put forth, um, and this is really important to me. I'm an educator by training. I'm an educator by design. Um, I'd like everybody to think about that there's a third grade girl, a nine-year-old girl um, listening to this conversation. And I pick girl because often we talk about boys instead of girls in that context. I pick third grade or nine years old because if you've had children or, or nieces and nephews, you know that that's such an important age in terms of maturation and going from kind of focus on family to focus on outside and other. Um, what do we want her to hear? What do we want her to take away? Um, do we want her to feel defeated, fatalist, um, fatalistic, um, defeated in the sense of there's no outcome? Um, or do we want her to be pragmatically optimistic? And if we want her to be pragmatically optimistic, what are we as adults doing to help pave the way for her and her generation to have that type of understanding, that type of connection? Um, that's incredibly important to me because as an educator, if I can't say that there's a possible outcome, I should never be in front of kids. I should never be interacting with kids because it's their future we're talking about. It's their future that's driving this, this conversation. Um, so with all that, um, what is imagination? Um, I'll tell you what it is for me. Um, and this comes through the research we did at Lincoln Center, uh, is um, it's the ability to think of things as if they could be otherwise. It's to ask what if. Um, it's to look at things um, in new ways by using your sensory receptors, your perceptual capabilities in new ways. Um, so the underlying value sets or the capacities are um, deep noticing, making connections, noticing patterns, um, making meaning. Those are all the perceptual based parts. Um, the uh, second layer of that are more the behavioral aspects of how do we embody that? How do we, how are we reflective around it? How do we take action? Um, but the one that stands out almost um, across the board is tolerance for ambiguity. And tolerance for ambiguity may sound like an abstract term, but it actually not only is a, is a emotional and psychological concept, but it's also stands in the way of most change 
processes because we um, we were uncomfortable with the absence of certainty or what we perceived to be a certainty in that moment. So that tolerance for ambiguity asks us to put things um, aside for a second and allow that uncertainty to, to take place, to take hold. Hi, Maria, good to see you. Um, so within all that, uh, and before we uh, go into our breakout rooms, which we need to, um, I'd like to start with one question that you take into the rooms. Um, we have a number of questions that we're gonna ask you um, as we go into the breakout rooms. And then, like I said, we'll come back into a group context. Um, and this was asked of me years ago, um, and it stuck with me as a really important question because of the, uh, the complexity of what seems to be a really simple question is, why should a cab driver be imaginative? Should a cab driver be imaginative? And if so, why? Why should a cab driver be imaginative? Anybody's initial thoughts or reactions to it? Should a cab driver be imaginative? For his own sake, for his own sanity, yes, he has to drive around all day. And so why not have some imagination to fulfill your hours long drives? That was my immediate thought when you said that. For himself personally, yes. And to add to that, I also think to think of new ways to get places and to be able to help maybe with the experience of the relationship between the passenger and the driver, that there might be, you know, opening up known possibilities yeah. in that moment interaction. Great. Yeah, for, for me, I think that it's um, like we may see him as a cab driver, but he is just more than that. So, uh, <laughs> It, he should be imaginative and he should think beyond as beyond his own profession also. So I think everyone should be imaginative and he should not be thinking only in just uh, in, in his role of as a cab driver, but beyond than that. So that that thought came to my mind when you said that he should be imaginative or not. Great. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? I'll chime in, uh, Scott. Um, I'm sitting here on the campus in Joburg University, and as this conversation started, two young men walked up to me in a sign. It said, 20 Rand, if you can make me laugh. And another <laughs> kid with the um, camera was doing this. And I don't know if you saw me gesticulating, but I was trying. And I commented to him that, wow, this is just a failure of imagination. And that almost got him to crack a smile, but I did fail. But of course, imagination just promotes engagement, right? Yep. So thus far, everybody's in agreement that imag or thinks that a cab driver should be imaginative. Is there anybody that thinks they shouldn't be? Need not be, and maybe is a more appropriate question or more apt question? I might jump in, but I think Edward has his hand up there. Yeah, please. I I can't see everybody, so just jump in if you if I don't see you. No Edward. worries. I was just saying. I mean, as first you and two sides as a Brit, um, the the cab drivers in London are the some have passed some of the hardest exams in the world. They have to memorize every street in London, and so the level of imagination required to tackle as well London traffic is one thing. Uh, the second for me is is a cab driver in a in a twenty minute. Uh, cab drive uh, in Mumbai gave me the best lesson ever about fasting uh, during Ramadan and it was purely triggered from me saying uh, I'm feeling a bit hungry and then from that it led to the most incredible conversation um, that I'll never forget and I think if that cab driver hadn't been willing to push and connect the dots then he wouldn't have been able to give me that that insight. So uh, yeah, absolutely. I think it's it can be an incredibly imaginative question. Great. Somebody else had it wanted to make a comment on it. Please, somebody's going to speak. 
Well, I, I think I read somewhere that without imagination, we wouldn't be able to plan anything. Um, so imagination is one of those cognitive abilities that humans have developed, without which we wouldn't even be able to plan our, our breakfast. So it's, it's fundamental for planning, you know, thinking about our next move, um, theory of mind. So imagining what someone else is thinking or what is about they're about to do or what they're feeling, which is also, so empathy is also important. It's not just imagination, but also the ability to empathize with uh, humans and non-humans, <laughs> because we also need to empathize with non-humans. Thank you for that, Aunt Lisa. The, um, one of the key aspects of when we were looking at imagination from a pedagogical kind of curricular perspective was uh, the, the empathy aspect of it. How do we teach or develop or inculcate or you know, enhance that ability to of not just young people, everybody to be more empathetic. And because um, I think it's a fair statement, as you were saying, in the absence of that, it's really hard to make change occur. Um, we have to be able to um, look at that um, from other people's perspectives and learn um, through that through that enterprise. And when I when I say horizontal thinking and, and action, that's kind of what I'm talking about because we're not getting locked into our silos of thought. We're looking at it from a broader perspective of change and how we bring those change variables together. Doesn't negate the science, doesn't negate the deep work that thankfully people who are more highly trained certainly than, than I could ever imagine to be are digging into it literally and figuratively. But how does it um, come back to that ability to be empathetic and to ask what if, to think of things as if they could be otherwise? It requires that kind of mindset. Um, so this was a question that I was asked at the first book signing in front of my board of directors um, by my board chair. And uh, since this is a public event, she's one of my favorite people. So by saying this, I'm no way making her sound like she was wrong in asking me the question. It was quite a provocative question in the moment. And my first response was, oh, I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. Um, but as I was standing there, I realized that it was the double layered meaning of the question that was confusing me. And by that, I mean, it actually is a question and, and the answer of many of you, um, it was a question that started to, um, the question almost tells its own story. If you're asking, should a cab driver be imaginative? We're assuming that maybe the cab driver shouldn't be imaginative. And why would we ever say that a human should not be something that is so key, it's so built into our DNA, it's so quintessentially human that um, we would assume nobody would, be, would need to be imaginative. So I asked the question, um, if you pose the question from the perspective, do I want someone who's gonna drive all around town kind of have fun in the process of doing it from the viewpoint of, I wanna go see this, I wanna go see this. Um, and uh, the, uh, the question would be, no, I don't want him to do that. I want him to do the job I hired him to do in that moment, which is to get me from point A to point B. So in that sense, I don't want him to be imaginative but that's imagination more as fantasy and play and kind of unfulfilled cognitive expectations. When you start to answer it from the perspective that, that you all just said, you're starting to look at it from who is that human? What does he or she have to say and do in the world? How do we help them? And how do we learn from them, be more imaginative? And then how to apply that in whatever industry or part of life they tend to go into. And so I started to say the same things and ask the same questions that you're asking, which is um, absolutely I want that person to be imaginative. Who better to think about disruption within the field of, of um, transportation? Um, also, you know, 
I don't know anything about that person. There's a pretty good chance that she or he had many more degrees than I have and have been, you know, came to the US and was, you know, driving a cab in New York City. Um, but they very likely could have been an electrical engineer or somebody with advanced degrees. So on top of that, we don't really know anything about them. So why should we assume we do just because of the job they're doing in that moment in time? And then on top of that, um, we don't know what cheer he does at night or after work or even during work. Um, how, do we, how do we challenge that, you know, that, um, that thinking that the minimal things like that are not also essential things as it relates to the change process. And then finally, um, he or she probably has kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews or cousins. Um, what, what are they transpiring or passing on to, to them? So yes, I want that truck cab driver to be imaginative. Um, but I don't want the cab driver to think that this is about folly and fantasy and just doing whatever I want to do. And the reason that's relevant is that's the classical misunderstanding of what imagination is. We tend to confuse it with frivolous behavior or non-constructive behavior. Whereas from my perspective, it's, as I said before, it's about as human and about as quintessentially human as you can get as it relates to the lived experience. Um, any other thoughts on, on you know, that cab driver and his or her journey through the streets of New York? I would just say um, when, when you said to, uh, that uh, not the frivolous fantasy behavior, there's also a good place for that too. And that's absolutely, also, absolutely. you know, and, 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 and when I think of, of, of a cab driver, of course, there's the whole person there. Um, but as interesting to me would also be possibly that way of thinking. And who is this person even on that lighter side of, of life, because life's very heavy as it is. So, you know, let's play with that as well. That was just something I thought. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, well, I, I just, what comes to me is without imagination, it would be very limited. With, with imagination, more possibility is there, which leads to abundance, which leads to more happiness and inspiration. So without imagination, life is a bit more dull. And why would we want dullness for anybody? Right. In Dewey's terms, that would be aesthetic and anesthetic. Why would you choose an anesthetic or a dull and numb kind of laminated um, life experience when you know, it can be full of questions and, and curiosities? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would also like to add that um, I think imagination is the place where all, all the innovation, everything, it starts from the imagination. So I think that is a very, very important, I would say, place in our mind, in every human being's mind, I would say. And I actually usually say that this is the place where all the magic happens. Like whatever you think, if your mind can conceive it, you can actually do it. So I personally think this is um, something, whatever, not only like the cab driver or anyone, like, but if they can think, yeah, if they can imagine anything and then they can actually put it into the reality because they are like, uh, I see reality and imaginations are quite linked because the first step to enter in the reality is I think the imagination. So it's quite philosophical from a point of view, but that is my point of view. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I, I'm just gonna jump here from what Amrin said, because I, I, I agree that, um, I suppose when, when we look at the question, it, it's there's an element of, uh, you know, semantic, um, uh, uh, you know, query here, because should, should the cab driver be um, imaginative? The cab driver is a human being and imagination is an in, is an inherent aspect of being human because without imagination, we wouldn't have created the world that we have. If we look at the word itself, um, it's the world of images, it's the world of pictures, it's the world of our minds. So we are creating 
every day <laughs> at any point. So should the cab driver be imaginative in his role as cab driver, but inherently as a human being, they are, or they have the ability mm. to imagine in that sense. So I guess it's, it's looking at the way we ask the questions as well, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite agree, quite agree. I want to welcome Adama to the group. Um, I don't see you, but I want to welcome. We knew you were going to be a little bit late. Um, so welcome. Thank you. I'm so uh, sorry I had another um, engagement, but I'm honored always to be on a platform with beautiful people. The diversity is always a blessing. And um, just the whole, I, I kind of caught in what you guys were talking about creativity and I guess the importance of creativity in um, making a difference, making an impact, especially with the SDGs. Um, I, am, I am a big proponent of the mind is powerful and it has the ability to change lives. And if you're not creative, especially as someone, I, I'm a founder and director of an Impact Sierra Leone organization where we uh, work with um, communities in Sierra Leone. And if you're not creative, <laughs> you know, it really does uh, impact you. For me, um, it, it, I have to think about ways and how to reach them where they are. We are different cultures and that creativity, creativity is mandatory when you're working with diverse um, cultures and, you know, really trying to um, meet them where they are, change their lives, you know. And for me, I, I love the power of words and I work with a community who are, um, 85, 80% illiterate. And so I must be creative in reaching them <laughs> and then being able to um, let them feel hope. And I do that through pictures and I do that through using my voice and, you know, making things inspiring. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be in this space because I don't think that people really understand the value of your words and speaking to people and embracing people and serving people. So creativity is a mandatory. You have you have to be colorful. You have to always think outside the box. You know, when things work one way, and it you you have in your mind that it's gonna work and it doesn't. So you have to go back to the table and think what will work. And so I always tell people that are around me, you know, you're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna you're gonna find a joy in something, and we're not gonna be depressed. We're gonna use our minds to creatively inspire people. And they're going to also, when we leave, inspire others. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. And um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to uh, change lives through that in that manner. We're Thank honored, you. Judy. Thank you. Um, research has also shown that, uh, as I mentioned before, I don't think we're all on yet, but uh, IBM did a study a number of years ago of business leaders from around the globe um, and ask the question, what are you looking for in your workforce? And the answer was critical and creative thinkers. Um, the problem is, is in any of you involved with business uh, schools and in the curriculum of business schools, um, uh, we tend to uh, not create the right structures to develop that capacity to be imaginative and creative and in fact, the research has shown, and this is not a statement I'm happy with, that if you look at parents, teachers, and business leaders, we say we want a workforce that's imaginative and creative. We say we want kids that are imaginative and creative. We say we want students that are to be imaginative and creative, but we don't create the structures or the mindset within those environments to foster that. And in fact, more often than not, quite the opposite, um, which goes back to the, you know, the question of why should a cab driver be imaginative? Um, because it's a confusion, once again, between um, play in its just the release of, you know, we all know play is important for kids, but it's the, you know, it's the release of energy and, and it's, it's socializing. But the... Uh, the, the, the question of the issue is, is how do we bring all that back to um, helping change happen so that the paradigm between what teachers want, what parents want, and what business leaders say they want, and how they also um, act is not inconsistent. 
And in a sense, that's the goal of this meeting and the goal of this structure. We're not a group of scientists, once again, talking about um, the science of it. We're not a group of economists talking about it from the perspective of, of uh, the economy, though those certainly could come in. We do have some legal experts on, on, the, uh, on the chat who um, I will pester you with questions of what are the legal implications of it, just as I was fortunate enough to ask the economist um, that uh, we're talking about writing a book um, around uh, imagination and the economy. But from an educational perspective um, and a change perspective within it, um, Gillian, you're, you're a professor of education. You're, um, this is your area in full disclosure. She and her colleague are writing a book on imagination and educational leadership, and they asked me to write the foreword or the opening of the book, in which I, I just did. But her research at Simon Fraser University in building on the work of Kira Egan, who was certainly one of the, I would say, the founding thinkers in this area. Um, what's your response to you know, the question so far, or your thoughts? Thank you so much, Scott. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, yes, absolutely. It's that really challenging space where we're dealing with misconception around what imagination is and how it's so centrally involved in our intellectual development already. Um, and the question you posed about the cab driver is just so great at pulling out some of those misconceptions and um, addressing those in education is a profound conversation. So my work has looked pedagogically at how do we teach in ways that develop the imagination K through 12 and Kieran Egan's work, imaginative education, teaching the storytelling, the ways we use cognitive tools to develop imagination. You wanna look that up if you've not heard of that. Um, the book that uh, sorry, Scott is referring to is indeed about how we bring imagination in a very practical and pragmatic way uh, into conversations around school leadership so that we can transform schools and communities. So coming out next year, but as part, I'd love for people to be engaged in a conversation around the actual text because it requires more and more people to take the words and put them into action in that way. So my response, Scott, is uh, the educational system is a huge place for change and also a hugely, uh, huge place of resistance to change. That's the other topic, but. Yeah, Thanks, our Ken. shared director, Ken Robinson, who tragically passed away this last year. Ken was the most popular of all TED Talks. And I've known Ken for 30 some years since he came from the UK to the US. Um, I take credit, and he would agree, um, helping him frame his argument um, from not just talking about creativity, but also talking about imagination, um, because they're often used interchangeably in conversations. Um, and by the way, uh, Naomi presented, you know, Imagination First um, a little bit ago. Uh, the goal of the book was to say, we pray at the altar of innovation, but how do you get there? Um, and you can't get there by just wanting to be there. You have to, from my perspective, you have to backward map it through, through creativity back to creating cultures of imaginative thinking. If we really want true innovation, um, and once again, if you look at the business school literature, um, it's dripping with examples of C-suite coming up with ideas um, that they think will enhance imaginative thinking, creative action within the, con the business context. They tend to be cliched. They tend to not be really there to challenge thinking. Um, they tend to not, you know, they're not, there's nothing wrong with them. Move the commissary 20% time being two of the major examples, but there are many others. You know, I've seen companies that create, you know, quite literally pick a room and call it the creativity room and there's music going on and there's you know, different lighting. Um, and, you know, if that's good in that moment, which I'm not sure it is, um, why is that just that one room? Why is that, you know, why is that there? Yes. May I quote from your book? Because I, there was a quote from Imagination First that led to several uh, papers and research on my part, because you said the quali quality and durability 
of any creative act depend in great measure on the fertility and force of the imagination that feeds the act. This is where it all begins. We reap what we sow. And so out of that has come a lot of research and writing in my work, because I think we need to reconceptualize the metaphors we use to describe imagination. I think we need to think about imagination as soil and it very grounded, but it also connects much more fully to the larger ways in which imagination is part of our human being. And so I'm trying to bring the balloons and the fairies and the unicorn conceptions of imagination. Not that that isn't a small piece of it, but if we want imagination to be taken seriously in climate change conversations, in boardrooms, everywhere we need to make realize that it's what's underfoot it's what connects us as humans through our shared stories and so anyway thank you for that quote because it's led to a a ton of writing and a push to change the metaphors we use to describe imagination great well thank you for that anybody else in response to that or in response to what we're talking about maria yeah yeah, I'd love to jump in and, uh, you know, first of all, the question about the cab driver, I think it's a great one. Again, connecting us all as humans, uh, not being defined as a title, whether or a job description, whether you're a cab driver, a doctor, you know, a psychologist, it, 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 as long as you're a human being, you should be able to use your imagination. It, it should be built in in the system which uh, brings me to the second question about the education system. Someone who is coming from a pretty strong background in business schools and someone who is working with some, uh, I, I'm biased, but I say some of the most imaginative startups in the world today, and some of them are addressing the issues of climate change. Uh, all these creative ideas would not happen without imagination. So it's almost, like you just said, it should be the soil and it should be, I will use the term normalized, but it should be taken as something that is a must have rather than a luxury. Uh, one thing again, coming from um, the business school perspective, when we look you know, at the top schools, on the one hand, they promote creativity and imagination, but underneath many of these concepts, Essentially, everyone are looking to train people to be more productive. And to some extent, there is a feeling, at least my sense, that imagination is wrongly very often is being perceived as counterproductive instead of something that increases productivity in the long run. And this is the perception, uh, I think, Jillian, that's what, where you were heading. This is the, some, the thing that we want to change because it's not counterproductive to be imaginative and to allow the possibility of doing things in different ways. Uh, I think that that's my take. Yeah, quite agree. Um, I believe there were a couple others who wanted to make comment, Anthony and Elisa, Ilik, um, please. As, as an urban planner, the smartest cities are those where Creativity is what you would call bounces off each other faster than others. So when you create hubs where creativity gather, can talk about new ideas, then the, the more that you create these hubs, the faster uh, is the economic and of course the intellectual center. So you're more competitive against others. Now, the, the thing about cab drivers is very interesting because uh, who hasn't been affected by cab drivers in today's life? Putin started as a cab driver. Mm -hmm. Robert De Niro, uh, the guy that invented Stein, uh, Steinfield, Danny Glover, uh, Robert De Niro. I mean, uh, how do they call it? So each and everybody could have an important role to play. And as I said, you know, these cab drivers are changing the way that we work today. And so this kind of ideology... And the fact that you know we don't leave anybody behind, uh, or if we do, it's to our peril. So as an urban planner, uh, the smartest cities are where creativity uh, and innovation and startups uh, are brought by putting creative people together. Great, thank you. I, and I'd love to pursue that concept with you, um, with your permission. Um, by the way, we we make the decision, uh, unbeknownst to most of you, to not go into the breakout rooms because oh. the field 
of this is working, why, you know, why change it? Um, and why lose time doing it? So with everybody's permission, um, uh, we'll stay in a group context throughout the two hours. Um, if you object to that, um, we'll have coffee on Monday and we can chat about it. Can I take the um, word? Pardon? Can I take the word? Yeah. Um, so um, you're going to hear me saying this a lot. So uh, I'm just going to put it out there. So the word imagination has as a root, uh, the word image. And image is basically what imagination is, is visual thinking. And visual thinking, again, is uh, related to the right hemisphere. Now I'm just connecting dots here, okay? Now, Scott talked about spot uh, light versus lantern attention. And Ian McGilchrist made exactly the same difference between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere attention. The left hemisphere is the spotlight and the right hemisphere is the lantern. And, uh, it's not a, it, it, as a suggestion to Gillian or Gillian, sorry, I don't know if I how to pronounce her name. Um, <laughs> the, the problem of, uh, uh, Ian McGilchrist identified the problem of the Western culture into being too left hemisphere based and to have shrunk our ability to use our right hemisphere, which is, and, and when you talk about cab drivers, they're using spatial awareness once again, and spatial, it's a spatial ability is again, a right hemisphere um, cognitive ability. So everything that you guys have brought up today uh, are consistent to Ian McGilchrist's hemispheric hypothesis. So um, I, will, I have used this hypothesis throughout my research, including uh, art and spirituality. Um, so my contribution, if, if I will have a contribution, is to use spirituality as a technique to access the right hemisphere and in, use spiritual techniques such as meditation. And I include art as a spiritual technique or a spiritual practice to access your imagination and expand it. So if there is one thing that um, uh, I personally would um, do is to uh, look at all practices, including nature, that can expand our right hemisphere thinking. Great, thank you. Follow up comments, um, other thoughts? I can chime in here, Scott. Um, this is Tony. I'm an earth <laughs> lawyer and um, I've been a lawyer for about 36 years. I've been an earthling for 62. That's a combined <laughs> 98 years of experience. So I know what I'm talking about. Um, and as a lawyer, um, what we're trained in some ways to do is ask questions. And what this insightful conversation has brought me to is the question, what triggers my imagination? And as soon as I was able to formulate that question, <laughs> this is uh, directly on point to um, visual images were just over flooding me that, you know, when I thought of just, again, tapping into what I think is my imagination, all these things that are challenging it right now that I can apply myself to imaginatively. So thank you for the sharing. And it's impressed me. That's great. Well, thank you. And uh, once again, the uh, I'm thrilled that those of you that are on that have legal background uh, are participating. I really do think uh, when I go back to the conversations we had in the U.S., it actually did lead to some new laws and new um, perspectives passed by legislatures around the role of imagination and creativity um, in education. Um, problem with it is, um, and anybody that's in education tragically knows the truth behind this, is more often than not, initiatives are given just enough money to not do much. Um, so there's, you know, there's a, a certain degree of 
build in acceptance and denial built into the the entirety of that process but it doesn't mean you know that it's not the right direction by any means um and once again you know you know keep in mind the you know the nine-year-old girl sitting here and listening to to this conversation um what do we want her to take away from it um have you all have you ever heard of um imaginal cells has anybody ever heard of it Imaginal cells are what happens um, when the uh, chrysalis, when the butterfly is going through its various stages of kind of metamorphosis or, or change. And I came across um, a, a, a statement about it that it spoke volumes to me because I, I love that there's the concept of imaginal cells in biology. Um, it's each is a cell of possibilities. Each has potential to foster incremental change. The fascinating gift of imaginative cells. It's like something out of a sci-fi movie, but of course, as, as with most awe-inspiring things in nature, it's mind-bogglingly real. Imagine a group of cells living inside you, lying dormant until just the right time when they strike and dissolve into an organic goop. But before you're liquefied into a puddle of oblivion, your own immune system wages war against these cells of yours, attacking, resisting the threat of total annihilation of yourself as you know it. This frightful transformation of what happens to our lowly caterpillar once it enters into its chrysalis. And these cells bearing the signals of both complete destruction and glorious transmorph gratification are so aptly called imaginal cells. How heroic caterpillars are to go through such an ordeal. How heroic we are too to recognize the cells of change within us and not knowing the outcome to fight against ourselves, our old habits, our society, friends and family, even to forge ahead in the belief that we will become something new and better through these, wor these worthy efforts. That is the lesson of the butterfly. That can, change can be terrifying, but so utterly beautiful. I mean, does, does that speak to anybody as it does to me? Does that resonate as kind of a, almost a metaphorical image-based um, kind of call to action, uh, if you will? Does it, how do you, how do you respond to that? Um, well, I'd love to contribute. I, I think that the metaphor is apt for the moment also because we need to create environments where those cells can grow, right? So I keep coming back to this idea of soil um, and this sort of foundational, the foundational nutrients that we need in order to be imaginative. And I work in the, in the green space parks. Well, it's, I don't work. It's my vocation, right? I created a park um, in Atlanta where we try to provide, um, you know, an ecosystem of nature um, and free play for underserved communities. Um, and if you don't have those spaces, how can you, how can your cells even grow and create? So I think that the metaphor is powerful for the moment because a lot of the work that I think we're doing collectively is a counter narrative to the 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 actions of the day um you know the commodification of imagination or the commodification of creativity to sort of artificially find inputs to try to create an output where really it's just about having access i mean not just but part of the way we can access imagination is providing truly access to places where that soil you know, you can literally roll around in that soil, um, whether you're eight months old or 80 years old. Um, and you, we, we experience it differently at different ages, but the freedom to be able to sort of wander and commune, and not even just commune with the green space, but to commune with the community that is also attracted to those spaces. Um, I think that there's a, I, I'd like to think that there's a movement afoot that recognizes and normalizes the necessity for, for this sort of touch point as we try to achieve 
a healthier society and a more equitable society. So Scott, let me, let me, if I could um, add on to that. I love the, um, the analogy, oh, well, the, the reference to imaginal cells. And what's interesting about that is that they're often, they actually start as single cells. So I think you and I may have spoken about this and they're actually threats to the caterpillar at first and the, the caterpillar's at immune system actually attacks them first but they persist and they actually stay there they multiply and they start connecting and that's when they actually create a multi-cell organism becoming a butterfly and you and I had a um, wonderful conversation about Ken Robinson and I love the way he then talks about imagination which is the ability to bring to mind things that are nascent to our senses they are not immediately obvious to to our senses and coming from a um, digital design background you know I see it quite separate to um, creativity which we often consider as a process right it, it's the process of actually um, going through uh, create I'm going to say bringing through ideas and then actually um, applying original thought to it and uh, assigning value uh, to that original thought. And value is a very esoteric word because it depends in the process of creativity um, what you, uh, uh, who, who considers this valuable, right? And how much would someone attach, um, uh, you know, uh, whether it's a, a dollar value or emotional value or physical value to this thing that you've actually created. And I, when I think about the um, discussion about education, I actually do speak a, a lot about this, even though it is not in my immediate field. I think about um, uh, the way we've actually created the entire education system. And it's, it, 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 there's a term for it that Ken Robinson's use, Ken Robinson uses, he, and he calls it industrialized education because it is set today to mimic the industrial revolution where we beat all sense of imagination and creativity out of it. And the essence of it is to conform, not to create, right? And it takes away the two basic things um, that, that actually unleashes future potential, much like imaginal cells, right? It take, takes away the, the science of learning. I'm gonna say the science of learning and then the art of teaching. And all it does is it, it, it actually just educates, but it educates in a very assessment uh, academic way. And that is meant to bring the next generation to the top of the creative part. Because if you're the smartest person in the room, room that can speak at the longest length of any um, subject with all the knowledge in the world, you must be the most creative. And that's how actually, industry values who is the most intelligent and brighter than best and rise at the top i've had many an edu uh, a discussion of education um, uh, institution here in hong kong and i said what industry funny enough cherishes the most post about 25 years of education is guess what individualism and the ability to think outside the square but by the time the kids go through this whole system, which we call education, their learning agility is shot to pieces and the ability to stand out as individuals is non-existent. And actually they come into the workplace and we've actually got to retrain them all over again to be a child. And um, it's, um, it's uh, I think it's a sad indictment of our education system. Absolutely. And that has to change. Actually got to get the recreate it and that and and I think the word Kate Robinson is Ken Robinson's um, daughter she actually talks about the regenerativeness and the rewilding uh, which is if you left nature to its own it would actually know how to rejuvenate itself and it's almost as if to say if you left kids to their own they are natural learners as 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 they would be as adults if you actually left them to themselves. And I think we actually need to recreate those ecosystems to flourish in that first okay. 25 years of their lives. Yep. I'd love, I'd love to come in and, and just contribute, if I may, on that a little bit, because I, I love that. I, I'm, 
uh, coming from a permaculture background with Ayurveda, I, I literally uh, work with the elements. I have a, a passion for that and the, all the soil analogies. And, and, and for me, one of, the, one of the interesting things, and thank you all, because I feel like that 16-year-old right now, actually. And, uh, and, and with that, I'm noticing excitement. And with that, I'm noticing inspiration. So for me, these are kind of words that sit with uh, imagination. And I'm very, very interested, uh, and I'm interested to hear what other people think about this, about if imagination for me is the plant that I'm growing in my soil, then how do I nurture my soil? So for me, it would be, how do I, um, how do I allow that that soil of imagination where imagination has come from to flourish what is it i need to do or in the environment needs to do and, and jacqueline quite obviously you know I, I love that you just let it do what it does nature is irrefutable and we learn from that because it obviously it doesn't lie but if we understand the characteristics of what we're working with then we can actually enhance slow it down or, or, or whatever we can work with it but with the soil analogy, it's like, for me, what creates good soil within us? Because if these changes start from us, which I'm a big believer in, um, then how do those things come in more? So if, if I'm, what is containing my soil and how do I enhance that? What is it that can be done to um, have an abundance of imagination? Uh, if, if we look at things like, you know, that I'm very passionate about, like yoga or Ayurveda, um, quite often for me, creativity and, and from people I work with, it, it seems to suggest the same for them as well, is it comes when there's a lot of space. It comes when there's a lot of relaxation. It comes when it's in its, and I say it, I mean us or the environment, is in its natural state. So what is that natural state and how do we work with it? That there's a beautiful thing in permaculture, which I, I don't think is, for me, limited to the environment. It's something I use socially and in my own life, which is value the margins. And if I go back to the butterfly and the chrysalis and then the butterfly, there is a lot of friction going on there. And the friction is the margin. And if we value the margins, then quite often it's where the beauty comes from. If we understand the characteristics of that, we can potentially enhance it so I, I love that kind of thing when it comes back in for me about um how is imagination understood to come in in an abundance um, um yeah so i really like the conversation around like where that imagination exists um i think like we like Justin just said on when it comes to getting the space, having the space to actually be creative, I think that's one thing. And I also think though naturally that we do have, um, that inherently we do have this push to problem solve as people. And I think that actually starts when you're really, really young. And so I do think that even facing like different challenges can be a catalyst for your imagination to think beyond what's right in front of you. Um, so I, I guess that like I look at problem solving in that way. And I think part of um, this also leads me towards the kinds of work that I do, because, for example, at Start Network, we are doing the whole problem solving um, when it comes to the humanitarian system. And so things like slow and reactive funding, how are we changing that? How are we pushing for innovation? And also, I think Mr. Diaz also talked about the importance of hubs. So like we do also try to get some of that expertise from the people who are closest to what the problem is. And I think that's another way to realize that your imagination sometimes also has limits in terms of, because people tend to say that your imagination is limitless. I do think it's limited by your capacity in terms of your scope in terms of how far your thinking can progress. And that's why bringing in other people who are closer to where your imagination wants to go um, sometimes also helps you actually achieve what that is that's in your imagination. Um, yeah, and I really like all these ideas around soil and growth and being able to like, catalyze whatever that imagination is. So yeah, thank you everyone. Great, thank you.
I'd like to come in really quick. Um, as we talk about soil, it, it's I'm, I'm I've now fallen in love with agriculture. <laughs> so we're talking about soil. I'm remembering uh, we launched actually with our organization a project called Seeds of Life because we wanted to teach the children um, about agriculture, about farming, uh, because it's a farming community. So we kind of decided, you know, rather to try to come up with our own, you know, solutions to poverty that is existing in that community, we decided to come and meet them where they were. And they loved it. And the embrace of just, you know, coming up with ways how to, from the beginning, start teaching the children from the seed to learning about the soil to learning about um, the different crops that grow in different times and seasons um, in that part of, Af and of Sierra Leone. Um, it's taught me a lot. I've, I've never been someone that's been in soil. <laughs> I've always been uh, on the outside and I love to look at butterflies, but to really think about what transformation it has to take to get to that beautiful uh, soaring moment, um, it's it's amazing. But um, you know, we 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 constantly look for ways to make um, the learning. Um, while we can't change their current curriculum, we can complement it. And that um, this project is actually uh, a lot of the kids gave us testimonials that they are happy just to be able to learn something new, um, applying the different. Um, techniques um, in growing things that um, we, we grew. We recently um, harvested an abundance of groundnuts for the children. And uh, it's it's been such an amazing thing for me. Even though I'm not in Africa, I get to learn from afar and find the resources for them. But that's actually been something that's prompted me to really look at agriculture and soil and just the, just the whole, um, you know, aspect of growing something. It, it actually takes you into a space. I feel like it's a confidence builder for a lot of the children um, that are part of it, you know, and I'm hoping that, you know, we can transform one of the children. Maybe they will become and in, in, in turn take this into their future aspiration. Maybe they will pull out a leader and so on. But I, I, I just look at it as something that's unfortunate because I know growing up in the DC area, we used to have those creative spaces. We used to have the home economics. We used to have those different opportunities to outside of your normal subjects. We learned all these different things that pulled out that creative mindset and sewing. But then you know, due to funding and due to the thought that it's not needed, you know, in the education space, you know, it's it, it was taken out. But I, I just wanted to just appreciate this um, conversation because, you know, I get to firsthand see what taking children outside of their um, their uh, environment to teach it, teaching them how to build their confidence and to learn how to grow something in that aspect. So, um, and for us, it, it's, it meets two needs because this food security is an issue in um, Sierra Leone. And so being able to uh, teach people about agriculture, that's, that's, that's more people that are going to be brought to the table that will help uh, close that gap. So I just want to appreciate this conversation. Um, and hopefully we can take the seeds from this conversation to doing other things. So thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Adama. Yeah, uh, I would like to just add a little bit of my uh, perspective also. And I love the analogy of imaginal cell and the soil. Um, to me, like I uh, always think like this imagination is sort of um I also like this uh this comment by Annalisa that you know it's like and my concept is more like a spirituality or something it's it's the point which connect I feel the imagination that connects our consciousness and our intuition and and then I would just say that like it's it connects our soul with the body because that's how it is and when we imagine something that that gives us the um the, our thoughts the channel that this is this way to go right it directs us from this and that's that's what exactly um that when you share this uh example of imaginal cell when these there was when the uh, when the butterfly is transforming and they said that it's tagged but actually the they all grew into something new. And, and that's where it is, like, you know, in imagination is the place where it 
it gives you the accessibility to all the ideas in a very, very different way. And like you get you get the chance to connect with the universe through your you know intuition and through the, the that space. And that that is so fascinating that you know and one thing that I also want to point out here that it's that as we all are saying that it's uh, like uh, the education system is not the correct way like it's nurturing the uh, imagination in the right way we need to expand it in a in a in a different way and that's that's and that's where we need to come up and and here i also want to say that imagination is just not only the visual or image or something we need to when we say imagination we also add the emotions and the other because you know it's not only just think in terms of visual or visualization no for me imagination is beyond than that you need to even feel it uh, and experience it in a holistic way so that's that's just my opinion on that and thank you Amber. much appreciated um I was just thinking, do you mind if I hop in here? Please, go for it. Um, I, I just wanted to just say a little bit about myself, uh, just to all of you, as I don't have a, um, um, a background that most of you seem to have. Uh, I literally have uh, sailed around the world for the last 30 years with, with children and family, a large group of us. And where this um, comes into the conversation is we were a family who imagined what it would be like to take our extended family and our children and to, to educate them on the sea, on a sailboat, and to um, imagine how it would be to live together as a community in, in dealing with the um, the elements and, and uh, possibilities of, of anything, not being able to really, to really foresee anything. And how could that um, become a life of, of uh, openness and, and um, communication and education? And, uh, and we did that and, and it was successful. We, we, we did a two year circumnavigation and, and continued to sail after that. Then we, decided, well, how would it be to go on shore and live together, like buy a, a property and all of us, and, and, and I'm talking about now up to 60 people, all of us live together and ha educate our kids in the community. And, um, and then how would it be to work together, to start businesses together? And so we created businesses and Anyway, so this has been over a long period of time, but I think that it took a lot of courage to take that imagination and actually do it. And there's a lot of fear that happens in the process of taking, taking that courage. So I think that, um, I, think that, that I, I just wanted to share that with you just because I, I think that it's partly came from imagining what, you know, what a life could look like by doing that. And, um, and Jacqueline, a lot of what you said, I, I really agreed with in, in regards to the education. I thought what you said was brilliant. And some of the things I think that are hurting our kids today and imagination is the way parenting has become such a, um, there's so much of this helicopter parenting and uh, the, the, a lot of parents are so on their children. I mean, they're even, you know, arranging their play dates and including themselves into their play dates. And I think that this is really, really um, hindering the imagination of children. And so I think, you know, I don't know what the answer to this is on a, on a global scale, but, but parenting is such a huge part, teaching how to parent in the right way. Um, is such a huge part of, of, of the, sol the solving this problem. And then of course the teachers and the schools and the, the mentors, this is where it I, I think it has to start. Um, I, I can't say I know what the, the answer is, but, um, but that's, that's, 
you know, what I thought and, and, and listen, and in thinking of that nine-year-old girl, um, and what would she, what would, how would she feel listening to this conversation? I think children want to be seen and heard. That's the basic first thing. I think they want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to feel loved. They want to feel secure. And so us as adults in this world, how do we make it a place where they can feel seen, heard, loved, accepted, to say anything, to be individual people as we all are, to be, to be respected and to be, you know, told that what they think and what they, what they feel, what they is accepted and they, that, you know, to, to feel the permission to, to speak all of that. I think that is a huge part of what I would want a nine-year-old girl to hear in this conversation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Naomi. Much appreciated. Um, can I jump in any, on? I have a few thoughts. On that? Yeah. Ben? Yeah, I, I was just wanted to, to to jump in, though not being a parent, but I think I, I really uh, hear what you're saying and and a common thread, uh, maybe that I've just been really enjoying hearing is about across the different examples the the benefit to imagination of pushing forward unlikely connections and I think uh, you mentioned for example Naomi the different layers almost of society and education but you know where are we creating the spaces for them to uh, meaningfully interact and kind of giving permission as well for those to interact and, and I think another thread that seems to have come up a lot through examples is, and I'm noticing a lot uh, entering into conversations around things like systems thinking that I'm still not fully sure that I understand, but it's around, uh, people seem to be going more and more back towards um, kind of biological vocabulary or living systems vocabulary, things that have stood the test of time, like how are we mutating, how are we adapting, how are we evolving ideas, how are we replicating ideas? And I think uh, when we're thinking about these kind of unlikely connections that clearly help to place people in their kind of stretch zone that's needed, it seems if we agree to be imaginative, it, I think it, it sometimes can be helpful for us to think back to what have been the most complex systems that have emerged and the sheer levels of imagination that's been required to kind of put say evolution kind of into place um, when you ground that down, I think we need to be kind of giving more space for that as well, thinking, you know, what would it look like if you put, you know, eight different personalities in a room and if you just encourage an idea to mutate, what would that mutation look like? Um, and the last thing is, and it's not a plug for me, but for a, a partner that I work with uh, is a mentoring. And I was just mentioning at the start, I'm wearing a hoodie rarely for a session, but it's just because uh, AIM started with uh, 15 uh, kids as an indigenous mentoring experience in Australia. It's now in 55 countries around the world and everything they do, the common thread is imagination. So they're launching an imagination university and we're looking at imagination circles uh, with them. Um, and they just see it as every time they have a new project, uh, they create a hoodie design for it. So they try to co-create a hoodie design. So on the back, is a very, at least a much more imaginative uh, design than on the front, but it's just to uh, kind of close the thread that uh, for them it's imagination, unlikely connections, and thinking about kind of the most complex living systems and what we can learn from them to be as imaginative as possible. So yeah, that's uh, where I really feel Thank kind you. of, I hope uh, these conversations can continue to go, but thanks so much for today. Thank can you. I have one more thing? Um, Cause Naomi, I, I loved what you said um, and it made me think and connect back to the caterpillar before it becomes a butterfly. And how do we really stretch ourselves to use our imagination? Not when we have freedom and we feel safe, but when we're scared and things are uncomfortable and, and we're sort of in that, in that point before we become a butterfly or before something emerges. I think that that's when imagination is so important. And I was, and, you know, I, I do know Naomi, but the the system and ecosystem and family that she's talking about and what they created, I mean, it's an incredible thing. And so, but it, you know, it's not always comfortable doing that. So I think that that's where our imaginations, you know, 
need to it, it doesn't always come naturally I, I think when when people are scared or you know or feel trapped or whatever whatever it may be and that's when we you know and faith and spiritual you know all those things play and I, I mean there's been so many amazing things said but I see how it all connects um whether it's personally or to the you know sort of worldview of what we're all dealing with you know from a climate perspective and you know and and just human perspective so I just I want to thank everybody for all thank of you. your effort. thanks Okay, I, I wanted to bring the conversation, I think, a little bit closer to the reason we, we met, which was about the climate change and the environment. And uh, the other contribution that I hope to give to this group is from anthropology. And um, um, if you, anthropology, I think today is at the forefront of bringing indigenous knowledge into Western knowledge. Um, and there are, um, well, there are activist anthropologists that are pushing this um, discourse quite strongly, and rightly so, um, because what we did we need is a paradigm shift, uh, which again correlate with the left and the right hemisphere. So we need to move from a dualistic thinking to a monistic thinking, and it goes back to the holism that people have been talking about, reconnecting emotion to rationality. Um, and what I strongly recommend is to uh, bring more anthropologists to this group. Um, for example, um, Tim Ingold, um, Holbrand, uh, Viveiros de Castro, they are uh, pushing uh, animism as a new way of thinking in the West. So revaluing, revaluing uh, indigenous, indigenous knowledge um, practices such as shamanism that happens all over the world, except that, except for for the the West. Um, so we can't really move forward if we don't change consciousness, um, which is, goes back to my uh, mention of spirituality, which shouldn't be intended as religion, but it should be intended as the space where we feel intuitively um, in a holistic way. So um, in my personal opinion, um, climate change is not gonna happen until uh, we do realize this shift of consciousness globally, um, because it's only when we start thinking holistically and, and we feel our connection to the environment that you can really change First, you have to change the hearts, then you can change the minds. It's never the other way around. You can't change the minds using science. You first have to change the hearts. Um, and I think indigenous knowledge can be a great source of know-how. Mm -hmm. I have a question, Annalisa. It's, it's something I, I remember hearing an NPR um, presentation public radio a number of years ago, talking about um, language structure of uh, indigenous groups. And of course, it's not fair to put all indigenous groups into one category. But in general, um, uh, what was fascinating was a linguist talking about how in indigenous cultures, there tends to be much more of an emphasis toward verbs than nouns. Um, and we in Western uh, we tend to use nouns more. We tend to like categorizing and organizing through nouns, whereas verbs talk more about action and thought. And, um, and uh, in my work, um, I think it as the difference between transaction and interaction. We tend to think of transaction as you know, the, the heftier of that, but it's the interaction that makes the transaction reasonable and possible. But is that that idea of verbs and nouns, has that come out in your, your study and your work? So, so that's uh, linguistic anthropology, which is not my specialization. But yes, I've come across this kind of uh, comments in several papers that we read. Uh, another one that I thought was very interesting, I think it was a, an Amazonian um, indigenous tribe where they don't, it would be offensive to call anyone by their name because people are identified based on their uh, familial relations. 
So you would always address somebody as the son of, the daughter of, the wife of. And this is because, um, not this is because, um, it, comes, it kind of goes back to this right hemisphere idea that the right hemisphere is about interconnectivity. And so um, indigenous cultures um, and pre-Western cultures um, tend to put more emphasis on connectivity and interconnection in, uh, among the individuals. So the collectivity or the community is more important than the individuals. We have gone completely the other way. We have put the ego and the individualism at the forefront of everything we do, particularly in the States, uh, but in Europe as well. Um, and um, we have to move that needle back more towards the center. I'm not saying that the ego should disappear completely, but if you, stu if you study any spiritual system, that's where it goes. It goes about um, dissolving the ego. And it's only after dissolving your ego that you, you reach agape or love for humanity and creation. So the ego stops people from seeing the rest. So okay. indigenous cultures uh, cultivate that type of being in the world versus our way of being in the world that is individualistic. Great. Thank you. I'd just like to just to, to contribute on that, Anna Luis. Uh, Anna Luis, I, I love that. I, I it, it just makes so much sense because uh, nature for me makes so much sense. And if I, it, it, in my permaculture brain uh, and heart and my Ayurveda uh, kind of rationale, if I benchmark what you just said, if I if I test it based on some of the principles of Ayurveda and permaculture, it it is true because. The, the, the first principle of, of permaculture is observe and interact. Now, a lot of people think that's to do with your environment, which of course it is. Why does that grow with that and that altitude? And why is that? But also there's a social impact on that as well. And, and, and that social impact lends me towards listening as much as I talk. <laughs> Hopefully I get that right in this. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, when I break that down even further is sustainability equals local equals listening to those that are local to that place. And that's irrefutable for me, because if I, if I test that, um, I can have permaculture knowledge and apply it anywhere, and it will fail in certain ways in certain places if I don't listen to what is already there. And, and, and so I just love the way you put that forward. It really resonated for me. Yeah. I just wanted to add, I was thinking, like. Uh, how there are different kinds of words in Urdu for love and it's not the case in English language. It's a nuanced experience for us who, who is reading a literature or poetry in Urdu language. So it is for me, imagination is also thinking beyond language itself. And I was also, when, when I was learning Korean by, by myself, I recognized the use of word like which is much more prominent in the culture uh, rather than um, the word of love. And I think that is why uh, learning language is such a transformative uh, force in your life because it just fundamentally changed your association with things. And then you are like forced to recognize and pay attention to the little things that, that become very automatic for you. And uh, the earlier question that I could not answer was how, um, like, should cab driver be imaginative or not? So I think of it as this place where a cab driver has, ca car is a place where a cab driver has made um, his or her home. So there is like, I always see there's a background music playing, there's little like um, uh, deities if, if a person is Hindu, or a Muslim, so you will find certain um, symbols of that. Uh, there is also like proper like water bottle or food uh, because that person is spending the like the majority amount of time there. So I also think of it as a place for like for a, a cab driver to live. So. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Maria had to leave, but um, she 
mentioned, and I had referred to it, but she mentioned to a article um, called We Need Imagination Now More Than Ever by Martin Reeves and Jack Fuller um, uh, that uh, is really an interesting uh, discussion. They're both with the Boston Consulting Group. Those of you who don't know the Boston Consulting Group, it's considered one of the premier consulting agencies. Um, uh, and it's interesting that you know the whole article, the whole discussion, is um, around, uh, in my words, uh, that we're experiencing a failure of imagination, and the imaginative failure could be related back to many times in history when humans have have failed in our capacity to think imaginatively, act creatively. Um, but what's fascinating about it, and and you know, is that is from my perspective is the change in the language and the change in the discussions that are happening more and more today than happened five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago. Um, and that's very encouraging. Um, I'm a big believer and I, and I apologize for the, the reference of this statement, but I'm a b big believer in that credit's not given for predicting rain, credit's given for building arcs. Um, our job is to, you know, help that nine-year-old girl and that generation and the generations of, of, uh, of humanity to find our ways through the complexity of this. Once again, since we're not having a conversation about the science or the economics of it, we're really talking about the tone and the attitude and the perspective around it. Um, how do we move that forward um, when we're facing, when especially around climate, when we're facing not only, um, and I hope everybody agrees with this, we're against the clock. Um, we're against the clock in terms of the, the outcomes. But um, I came across um, some stats that even if they're as true as I, as I think they are, that 75% of young people today are experiencing some degree of anticipatory anxiety. Um, about climate um, and the health of the planet. But we, we've got that kind of backdrop going on. Uh, also, uh, that uh, studies have shown that 75%, and this is in the, uh, the Martin Reeves Jack Fuller article, that 75% view climate change as a major threat to our lives and communities. They also feel the closest, the next major closest threat in scale as the spread of false information. Um, so we're in this backdrop of you know, misinformation, false information, lack of information, um, disinformation, if you will, um, against uh, the need for change and action to happen in a concise and holistic way. Um, and then finally, in the spirit of this, um, I had come across a quote from Chief Looking Horse, who um, is described as holding a position um, that's similar to the Dalai Lama's in Tibetan uh, Buddhism, uh, but obviously within the uh, uh, Plains tribes. Humankind has gone too far in abusing Mother Earth. Now Mother Earth is sick. She has a fever. But let's not pretend that humans are destroying the earth. It will survive us no matter what we do or don't do. We're destroying ourselves. And, you know, it's, it's such a plain truth that we're, um, the earth's going to be, you know, the earth's going to rebound. No matter, you know, if, if, if we mess it up, the earth's going to rebound. As Ken Robinson used to say, it will shake us off like a rash. It will get rid of us. It will tell us, you know, this is not the this is not the solution we were looking for. But if you once again to that nine year old girl, I can't as an educator say that's the message. The message has to be that can't happen. How do we make that not happen? How do we use imagination and the capacities that are possible through it so we can imagine things as if they could be otherwise, which. Um, if there's a failure of imagination, and we talked about this in imagination first, then how do you make imagination go viral? Yes, education is one. Uh, we've been talking about that for on this call in certainly years. And yes, building it into business schools and, and social structures. But how do we make it go viral? Jillian? 
Um, that was another piece I have to, I, I've been meaning to tell you this in the times we've connected is that um, I have used that question is with students. It's very timely to talk about epidemics. And we don't want certain epidemics. We certainly have are hoping for the end of COVID-19. But what about epidemics of kindness? What about epidemics of imagination? And so I take that part of your book and I've asked graduate students and undergraduate students, what would be required to cultivate the kind of spread that's unstoppable? What would be required to reduce our immunity to imagination? It's a fascinating question. And I think it's the kind of question we need to ask that nine-year-old child because they're going to have a lot more ideas, honestly, than those of us that are sort of limited by the, the ways we've been taught to think about the world. So um, the idea of epidemics of imagination, I think it's a really timely and powerful thing that we might want to, as a group, maybe as this group, take to our communities and use in a provocative way to think about um, making a difference in the bigger picture. Anyway, it's been a great activity and I wrote a blog about it with their answers. Maybe I'll throw it in the chat, their answers to well, your question great. about that. Yeah, Julian. That would be great to, to read. I, I think that I, I agree with you that, um, that uh, young people are going to want to hear from younger people about uh, how to, to collaborate on this. And, and, and I hate to, 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 um, to say this, but there are, uh, positives, but influencers are who they are looking to. I mean, they're in there, they, you know, the, the youth are looking to people who influence them. So, and some of the influences, you know, are, are maybe not who we would like to be, our kids to be influenced by, but what if you took, in terms of going viral, what if you took the best influences around or the ones that are most popular and you get them together and you start to change their um, narrative or, or get them involved and excited about these types of things and imagination, do good, climate, all this thing, and get them to start influencing their followers. I mean, that's, you know, just one idea. Great, thank you. I, I do think that, that it makes so much sense to me because once again, we're, if we accept we're not trying to you know, talk about the science or even the economics of it, though we probably could, but that's not the goal of this. It is to figure out how, how to, whether we want to systematize, organize, educate, um, bake it into the environment, whatever image you want to use, um, the capacity to think imaginatively, act creatively. So once again, if you accept that part of that is tolerating ambiguity and empathy and deep noticing and making connections, the very act of becoming more imaginative, if you accept those capacities as the definition and others of imagination, it almost creates the environment and the need to do exactly what you just said, Naomi, is to, you know, is to pass it on, is to discuss it, is to inculcate it and to develop it. Um, the beauty of it is, is once again, it's so a part of who we are as humans. It's, it's in our DNA. This is not you know, this is not something we're talking about, you know, we're not talking about eating broccoli. You know, this is totally different. This is, you know, how do we build it in? Um, Alexandra, are you still there? Hi. I have, I have a question. You and I talked about, and I don't know if this is, um, if you're ready to talk about this or, or not, but you used a term, and I, and I know we're going to talk about this more, um, common highest vision. Um, could you, you know, without going into, you know, um, you know, too much about it, but what do you, what did you mean by it? What, what's the image that comes to your mind when you talk about common highest vision? Or, and you can change the word so it doesn't have to be just what Professor Hauserman is talking about. Yes. Um, so, okay. Thank you for the question. Um, this, this concept of the common highest vision is not mine. It is um, Professor Julia Hausermann's, um, the Director of uh, Rights and Humanity International. And um, essentially what I understand um, this means is that when we have a particularly difficult or complex problem, um, which involves a lot of people coming from different angles and different perspectives that sometimes can come across as conflicting, um, you know, the, this whole idea of conflicted interests, um, the, 
her approach has been to encourage all of the stakeholders, all of the people at the table to step away, I suppose, from that um, initial perspective and to zoom out, to look at the, at the vision, what they are actually intending to work towards. What is the vision? What is the purpose? What is the reason for the actions that they want to take or the decisions that they want to make? And people coming to the table are often, even though they are willing to go towards um, you know, an agreement or a conciliation, they don't always see that they're actually on the same page because they're coming at it from different angles and different perspectives and they are looking at different interests, possibly. The common, the common highest vision is, um, is essentially an approach whereby people are coming together to understand what they are working towards. And then there's a step back. Then, we, then we're looking at what steps we need to take from our own perspectives. Am I making sense? To me, you are. Oh yeah, <laughs> this is what I meant. Right, so, um... Thank you, and, and that's part of the goal of this, though not specifically the goal to come up with, you know, exactly that statement, um, but uh, how we can come up with vision statements or, um, you know, the highest, strongest, the most developed, the most concise, the most relevant, whatever images we want to use um, to put forth as a result of this um, conversation and moving forward toward other conversations. Um, uh, I'm also, also thinking, I mentioned earlier about LinkedIn um, and my journey on LinkedIn. Um, if you just think of six degrees of separation as a kind of a connective tissue concept, and it's something that I, I really hold very dear. Um, I remember seeing the play Six Degrees of Separation at Lincoln Center Theater years ago. Um, if you just do simple math, there's 20 of us on the call plus, you know, X number listening to the call. If each of us knows, you know, um, 2,500 people, start doing the math. And if that 2,500 people know others, um, it's not hard to start getting into scaled numbers that are massively impressive from a numbers perspective just using six degrees of separation, just using messaging um, as it relates to that. Um, I was reminded when I, I spent time in California working with doctors in precision medicine, I kept being invited to medical conferences to talk about um, precision medicine. And I kept coming up with, I don't know, I can't talk about precision medicine, but I can talk about precision education. And I can talk about using aggregated data to understand what are the, the issues that, that exist and then how that translates back into an N of one, how it impacts each individual. So we have reach and we have connection. It really, to a degree, depends on the statements that we make and how many, um, uh, how many of us you know, will use our resources uh, when I say we reached well over 8 million people when we did the 60 conversations in the U.S., most of that was through networking, uh, through social media networking, um, and, and it was extraordinary. Um, Barbara, if, if I may, you've done so much work um, in Mexico and other places around engagement of ideas and development of structures um, to do it. Just your thoughts on today or your thoughts on kind of the, you know, the, the trajectory of this, because you, you've been part of this for a while. Thank you, Scott. And everyone, this has been very uh, inspiring and nurturing. And I've just been trying to wrap my mind around everything. And to me, my question, like going back to what you were saying, Scott, we see this rising anxiety in children and teenagers. Um, are we having conversations with them, even though they notice, I remember being nine and being aware of what's going on, but also if we want to set the space for imagination, like how can we create then this uh, authentic, you know, honest uh, conversations without uh, destroying hope for them? So these are some of the, the questions I have like from today. 
So for me to think of this nine-year-old is um, and climate changes, um, like I, I, I find myself now in 15 years of doing this work in different places. Now as, as trying to even do, be a producer, right? Like how can I create new content in film and see in all these shows in Netflix as the, to create new narratives, right? And imagine new conversations. I find myself my daily struggle uh, as a woman in Mexico is the challenge of using imagination to articulate new narratives for hope and for a basic uh, demand of our rights, you know, for, for girls and women. How can we create role models? Like how can we ignite that hope uh, also without ignoring, you know, what is happening in front of our faces and having these conversations with youth and then bring that back to tangible solutions uh, in a world where because of social media, everything feels so ephemeral, right? Like you mentioned influencers, I work with a lot of them. Um, I don't know, how can we use more of these conversations and tap them also into products where they can reach a mass, mass audience uh, and ultimately we can create that empathy but with clear goals. No? Um, so as you see more than like an, a real comment is just a bunch of ideas from my own particular context. And if it is also relevant in imagination to bring that a uh, gender factor, because like as, a, as, as girls can, they, they can only imagine to be so much. It's only been 10 years since it's been uh, the agenda has been pushing, you know, girls can do anything and whatnot. Um, so I don't know. I just wanted to bring that to the table. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And by the way, in setting this up, um, the uh, bulk of those that we invited, those of you we invited are obviously um, uh, women, uh, females. And that was on purpose um, because we also do believe as part of this that uh, women in leadership, um, women empowerment um, is not just a, the right thing to do or, a, you know, a, a, or, or even the feminist thing to do per se. Um, but how can we solve the problems that we're talking about? Um, how can we even address them um, unless women are in leadership and not just um, break a glass ceiling here in their leadership, but leadership um, as a male identify as a male, I think that, um, you know, there's a huge opportunity in that, that if we don't figure out what that means and harness it in the best sense of the word, um, we're going to, we're, we're going to not figure it out. We're past 930. Um, so we've already had two hours. Um, I did want, um, I know um, from Keshef and Nohan Demiana, um, who, uh, you know, were quiet during this because they wanted to give me and the group time to ask the questions and interact. But I'd love to hear your thoughts, you know, as succinctly as possible so we can bring it to a conclusion. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, and, and to all our uh, speakers, uh, everyone also in the chat, whoever has been actively uh, speaking. Uh, I think as I said at the opening uh, remarks of mine that this is a very crucial juncture uh, both from the perspective of the Global Goals Week uh, and as Noha had mentioned at the Gen UN General Assembly's meeting uh, I, I feel that imagination uh, and, and again I think Noha also used the word disruption so to me uh, imagination can be one of those key tools uh, that decision makers or any human being can can you can utilize uh, to say that there is another way uh, and i think john lennon made the word imagine a little too popular for all of us across the world so so just uh, uh, just that i i feel imagination can also break certain systems the status quo which has led us to this point uh, today uh, uh, everyone has the diversity of opinions and and perspectives they have been so useful uh, you know in in sort of looking at where all imagination can be relevant and what is relevant within imagination as well so so my uh, my deepest uh, gratitude to 
all the speakers and and for Scott to set this up, uh, facilitating this uh, incredible conversation and taking the cause of imagination uh, further. Uh, my I think my only uh, like message last message would be that at the end of it all, uh, like uh, wherever it whether it is imagination or it's conventional thinking. We, we have to keep people in our minds, uh, communities which are the most affected due to the climate action, climate change that is happening around the world. Uh, some We know some people are more affected than the others. There's no denying uh, of that in, in the climate uh, fight. And, um, and I think that uh, right from that point to identifying communities uh, to mitigation of that entire uh, of effects that are happening to a, a new world uh, which which is more equal healthier greener uh, safer uh, imagination can be a very uh, powerful thing so so thank you everyone and uh, i'll invite Dimiana and noha for their remarks thank you thank you Kisha. so i couldn't agree more with everything that you've said and uh, for me, there's a couple of things that struck me, and I relate them very much to my field of work, which is international development. So, you know, using the, the example of the taxi driver, and, you know, I think someone mentioned it earlier, that, you know, the people closest to the actual situation impact, you know, are gaining experiences that should be leveraged in the design of everything from the policies to programs to solutions for you know global challenges so for me in the context of climate it's the women and girls who are the most impacted by the disasters it is the communities and how to build their resilience to address you know this crisis and capturing those voices you know maybe through an imaginative process would be very interesting how do you take this to the local people to the grassroots to those who are surviving and experiences the impact of climate change so this is one the second is you know uh, barbara you know really emphasized uh, the role of women so yes we need more women leadership in climate action uh, there aren't many women on tables you know shaping up the policies uh, deciding on the solutions and actions so we need more representation and for that we need education we need to build capacities and we need to reach all corners and countries of the world um another thing that really resonated with me is uh, i think naomi talked a lot about youth and the important role they they play because on the I, I have mixed feelings and you know I think it's critical to capture their voice and to bring them into you know shaping the future because they are the future but also you know I every time I watch you know young activists uh, of climate for example I feel like honestly as us you know uh, members of uh, companies NGOs should be taking greater responsibilities you know to really uh, end this crisis because you know, we are placing a significant responsibility and burden of a problem that maybe, you know, I don't want to say we each created and it's not intentional, but, you know, because of various reasons has been created by our generation and the previous generations and leaving it to the youth, you know, it's, it's, it's important that they be part of the solution, but it's also not, um, you know, I always feel like when I hear all these young activists, I'm like, oh, my God, we we need to be doing more today, you know, as parents, as educators, etc. So and I agree with everyone, uh, you know, change starts with us individuals. So, yes, this is not a dialogue about uh, science. And, you know, I'm not an expert on climate at all. But I think, you know, one of the, I you know, disruptive changes is to really create, uh, someone was talking about creating media and uh, communications that resonate with people, that bring this issue to the forefront. We need more of that. We need awareness and letting people see, you know, the end, you know, how the end could look, you know, because I don't think it's really hitting home yet for uh, various people around the world. And again, taking that approach, not from a top down uh, approach, but also bottom up and getting communities to create this awareness amongst them in a way that is culturally relevant and last but certainly not least 
I've heard the conversation and actually not participating has given me the advantage of really focusing on, on all the perspective. And I'm really grateful and blessed to have been part of this. It's been very rich and full of substance. But also, I, you know, as someone who works a lot on unconscious bias, stereotypes, there have been a lot of uh, judgments passed in terms of situations, etc. And it's only human. We all have this. But again, one of the key actions is our own self-awareness of, you know, in our everyday life, starting, you know, whether it's climate or gender or any other things and how this impacts people from all over the world. So in choosing our examples, our language, as Scott was speaking, and also separating our own personal uh, views around issues from really trying to come as a collective humanity, you know, to solve these very human issues. So I'd like to end it there. Thank you. Well put. Thank you. Thank you. Demiana, do you have any thoughts you want to end with? Uh, well, with the combination of everything that's been shared and the chats, which I hope all of you caught because there are some really great comments there. Um, I feel like we could go on for days talking about this. <laughs> we just touched on the topic and I think we could really dive even deeper um, uh, continuing uh, these conversations and such incredible insight um, shared and so much knowledge uh, I've learned from each one of you from your different domains and um, areas of expertise. And so I look forward to continuing the conversation and getting to know you all more. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you. Great. So thank you all. Um, I guess my last word would be is um, this was Friday afternoon. Let's see what happens Monday morning because the task is daunting, is huge. Um, uh, I do think it's a messaging and media discussion, as, as Noha said, and part of what we're going to do is regroup and get back to many of you, look at the dialogue and try to figure out how we can turn it into position statements, idea statements, um, uh, possibly even to media assets and, uh, and the like that um, can be passed around. Um, uh, you know, I'm an imagination junkie, I admit it, you know, I, it's part of who I am. I talk about it, think about it all the time. Um, but I don't do it just because I think it's fun and fanciful. I don't know any other way around the set of problems that humans face without us becoming more imaginative and taking this seriously, not just as a, you know, educational or social remediation, but building it into, baking it into the ecosystem. Um, and with that, I uh, could not be happier and thankful for all of your time and attention. Sorry we went over, um, but thank you all. You're an extraordinary group.